is available here today to answer your questions. We're going to be taking that much to the next level. And with that, we do welcome Mr. Fiberfield himself back to the exam room live. Dr. Will Bolsowitz, how are you, my friend? Congratulations on the release. Hello, Chuck. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. It's, you can see the smile on my face. It's a very big week for me. Um, I have been building up to this moment for like, you know, basically a year and a half. And it's a lot of work behind the scenes. You don't see the growth that's taking place behind the curtain, but there is a lot of growing and it all leads up to this moment where I finally get to share this book that I'm so proud of, the Fiber Fields Cookbook. So thank you for having me and thank you everyone for being here today with us. Oh man, and I'm, I'm so excited. I was thumbing through this book last night and I'm like, okay, well, what do we want to talk about? What questions do we have from the viewers? By the way, if you have a question for Dr. Bolt, let's go ahead and drop that in the comment or in the chat. We're going to get to as many as we can from the doctor's mailbag today. Dr. B, we already have questions about FODMAPs and histamine and synthetic substances in your foods and how they could be affecting your digestive tract. We've got questions on gluten and fermentation. I mean, basically, you name it, we're going to cover it. It's in the book, so I'm so happy that you're here today. So you ready to start taking some questions? Let's go. Let's go. Right. Come on. All right. The first person to lob a question your way is Tim. This is an interesting one, my friend. Tim wants to know, are you allergic to sugar if you have a sucrose intolerance? I know that's something that you cover in the book as well. Yeah, so this, okay, first of all, thank you, Tim, for this question. This is a potential game changer for some people who are here today. I'm just gonna tell you this right now. You hear all this hype about celiac disease or gluten-related issues, but you haven't been hearing about this, what you're reading right here, sucrose intolerance. And there are gonna be some of you that this, this is gonna change your life. So here's the deal. Um, sucrose intolerance is actually a genetically motivated condition, meaning that you are born with a predisposition. It's called C- S I D congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency. Now look, the name is super nerdy, but what you need to understand is that a person who has this condition, C S I D congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency, they struggle when they consume sucrose. You've probably heard of sucrose before. That's because sucrose is table sugar and you might be really good. All right, you might be SOS free. Say, I'm not including sugar in my food, right? I'm not baking with it. I'm not doing anything with it. I eat a clean diet. But here's the thing, sucrose is a healthy food too. And sucrose, when it's a part of like fruit, for example, or sweet potatoes, we're not vilifying oh, fruit or sweet potatoes. We're not saying that these are unhealthy foods. These are healthy foods. But if you have this condition, CSID, then you are in a position where you may struggle to process and digest that sucrose, whether it comes in a healthy food or whether you're eating a cookie or a cupcake. And so the, what can happen is that you eat the food and you get gas, bloating, potentially diarrhea. If you are someone who has been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, with SIBO, you're having gas, bloating, diarrhea, and you don't know why, you need to answer this question. Do you have sucrose intolerance? And it's easy. You do a breath okay. test. If you are in the United States, you can actually get your medical doctor to order this breath test for free. The company that makes the uh, enzyme replacement, which by the way, I have no relationship with, but the company that makes the enzyme replacement for this deficiency, they actually will offer the test to you for free. And if you discover that you have this, it could change your life. Here's a quick story, Chuck, I hope you don't mind. There was a woman who I used to work with who, uh, like I used to because she doesn't need me anymore. <laughs> she was suffering for 10 years with a diminished quality of life because of irritable bowel syndrome. She got diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome and then she bounced from doctor to doctor to doctor because no one was really making any progress. She was continuing to have diarrhea after meals. And when I talked to her, I asked the question, have you been tested for sucrose intolerance? The answer was, what are you talking about, doc? I said, okay, 
let's get you tested for sucrose intolerance. Let's do the breath test. She does the breath test, comes back positive. She goes on the enzyme replacement, which by the way is natural. The enzyme is completely naturally sourced. She goes on the enzyme replacement. Guess what happens to her irritable bowel syndrome? Gone. Nice. Non-existent. And the worst, so it, this brings up a couple points, which I hope, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but part of the issue here is once a person gets labeled with irritable bowel syndrome, it's like doctors stop thinking because everything is just IBS. Well, what if it's not IBS? What if it's something like this? This is part of what I'm giving you in my new cookbook. It's not just the cookbook. It has 125 recipes, but it's more than just the cookbook. This is a book that's going to give you the guidance that you need to be empowered for better health so that you can go and do something like go to your doctor and say, hey, I read about this sucrose intolerance in Dr. Bolsowitz's book. Can you arrange for me to have the breath test? And then you get an answer one way or the other. <laughs> and that could change your life. That's great, man. That's that's awesome. I didn't even know about a breath test being able uh, to be used to digest uh, to, to diagnose digestive disorders. Like that is that is wild to me, man. That is that is science at its finest. Well, and they have these different breath tests, Chuck. There's different breath tests for different things. There's a breath test for lactose intolerance. If you consume dairy, you could do a breath test breath test for lactose intolerance. That's actually pretty reliable. It's actually a pretty good test. This test for sucrose intolerance is a, is a reliable, good test. Now, they also have breath tests, for example, fructose intolerance. It's not reliable. It's not a very good test. I wouldn't waste your time or your money. It would just confuse you. And they have breath tests for SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. People often wonder about SIBO. By the way, I write about SIBO in the new book. I actually provide more detail and guidance than I've ever provided on the topic. But when it comes to SIBO, the breath test is like a flip of the coin, whether or not it's even accurate. Tons of false positives, tons of false negatives. You get a positive test, do you even know that it's a real positive test? You get a negative test, do you even know that it's a real negative test? So this is the this is the problem, is like we can't use tests that are not reliable. But what I'm telling you though is that for sucrose intolerance, we have a non-invasive, this does not require an endoscopy, non-invasive, easy test that you can do, you can get answers, and then you are empowered to make smarter choices going forward. One of the other things that you cover extensively in the Fiber Fueled Cookbook is histamine. And we have a question from Sarah who says, uh, and this is a really good point. She says, when I think of histamines, I think about seasonal allergies and things like claritin. So what is the connection between histamines and food? Okay. So before I start this, I, am, I have a feeling that the audience has not heard anything about histamine intolerance before. But I want to I do a quick survey here. And we're going to find out. So tell me in the chat box whether or not you have heard anything about histamine intolerance from your doctor, from the internet. If you have heard of it, I want to know what your source is and where you've heard of it, okay? So, because here's the thing. Histamine, so first of all, is related to seasonal allergies. Histamine is a part of our body. It's a normal part. It's not meant to be vilified. <laughs> because it's there and we need it when we're healthy. I have it running through my blood right now. But when histamine falls out of balance, this is when it can cause issues. Seasonal allergies is when your body reacts to like something in the air and it activates an uh, increase in histamine. It causes your body to release histamine and it's more histamine than what your body needs. And then you get these symptoms, right? So like you get the runny nose or sinusitis, congestion, stuff like that. Right. Histamine intolerance is also histamine out of balance. It's when our body has an excess of histamine because of the food that we eat. Food contains histamine. And the reason that food contains histamine, by the way, all food contains histamine. There's, there's, every single food has histamine, uh, but to varying amounts. The reason that food contains histamine is because of microbes. Microbes actually create histamine. And so, like, what are some sources of histamine in our diet? Okay, before I answer this question and talk about, like, the, hist the high histamine foods, I just want you to know, first of all, this is clearly defined in the book. You have a table 
Okay, it's in the book. It's also in the back of the book. By the way, you can download this table whether you buy my book or not. If you if you like, you can go to my website, theplantfedgut.com slash cookbook. And this is part of the bonus resources. The bonus resources are supposed to be for people who buy the book. I don't care. Just just take, just take them if you want to take them. All right. But, um, but basically, like all of this, it may seem complicated. I'm going to make this super simple for you guys. First of all, the high histamine foods, fermented, fermented foods are the top high histamine foods because the microbes, the microbes make histamine. Um, there are many animal products that contain a large amount of histamine, like cheese or fish. These can be exceedingly high. When it comes to plant foods, it's actually a fairly limited number of foods. It's not as many as you would think, but there are some big ones that we eat probably with root, like with frequency. Spinach, tomatoes, eggplant, dare I say it, avocados. Breaks my heart. I, I love avocado toast, Chuck. Oh, no. You know that. Dude, you're breaking <laughs> hearts, man. You're breaking hearts. I have hearts. a broken heart. I have a broken heart when it involves removing avocados. And, you know, by the way, uh, I've said this before on the exam room live, but I'm going to say it again. If when you make your avocado toast, if you have not put balsamic vinegar onto your toasted bread, it's time for you to do this. And then you should message me and let me know how wonderful it has been for your, like it, how much it has changed your life. In the book, it makes it super simple. Here are 26 low histamine recipes. And quite simply, eat this way. If you eat this way, then like, how do you feel? If you feel better, then you know that this is something that can potentially help you. And um, let me mention real quick, like some of the things that are high in histamine uh, or, or some of the symptoms of high histamine so that people know. So because it can manifest throughout your entire body, it's not just a digestive thing. When people have histamine intolerance, the number one symptom is bloating. So if you have bloating, you should open up your mind to the possibility, maybe this, is, maybe this could be an explanation for your bloating that's not getting better could be other digestive symptoms as well. But I'm about to list a bunch of symptoms and what I want the listeners at home to think about is like, do you have two of these symptoms? Because if you do, you might benefit from this low histamine diet. Okay, so starting at the top, headaches, migraines, runny nose, like, you know, like seasonal allergy type symptoms, runny nose after a meal, you eat food, so suddenly your nose starts running, sinus issues, congestion, sore throat, uh, rapid heartbeat, lightheadedness, palpitations, shortness of breath, uh, skin. So you could have a rash, um, hives, flushing, almost sounds like an allergy. It's not, it's actually the histamine. Uh, but hives, uh, um, flushing, and then of course the digestive symptoms. It goes like this. If you have two of these symptoms, you may have histamine intolerance, possible. How do we test it? Easy. Eat from this book. All right. Let me read for you. I hope you don't mind, Chuck. Let me read for oh, you okay. some of the recipes. Like, so if I didn't tell you that these recipes were low histamine, you would never know. Um, because you got things like a mango blueberry smoothie, sweet potato waffles, uh, blueberry buckwheat pancakes, sunburst summer salad, uh, the uh, pesto pasta salad, sweet corn and pepper gazpacho. Uh, we got sweet potato and black bean tacos, gado gado quinoa bowl, mango burrito bowl. I mean, you would never even know. You're just, you're just eating delicious quinoa. food. So what's cool is like you eat this way for two weeks, and then you see how you feel. I'm excited about some of those recipes, man. I'm really, really excited about some of those recipes. Matter of fact, I'm excited about next Monday night. Uh, when you and I are going to go into the kitchen and we're going to make a sweet potato burrito recipe that's in the book. I'm going to be cooking and you and I are going to be talking on Instagram live about 
uh, how the gut microbiome completely changes when there is extreme weight loss and, and you know, somebody who's been struggling with their health for so many years finally gets things on, on course. Like, it'll be really interesting to find out just what happens to the old digestive tract when all of that weight comes off and you start to eat that healthier diet. Like, is this going to be a radical overhaul that we expect? Is the transformation inside match what people are seeing on the outside? I would think so, but you're the expert, so we're going to save that one for Monday. But I'm excited about that burrito recipe. Um, I do have a question here from you, uh, for you rather, uh, from Melissa. And Melissa got a copy of uh, the Fiber Fuels cookbook yesterday, got the Kindle version, has been flipping through it. Uh, we're talking about histamines here. And there's a chart in there, she says, um, uh, and it lists some specific nut butters and some that you may want to try compared to others. So her question is, why is peanut or cashew butter, why are they more likely to be a histamine trigger than almond or sunflower butter? Yeah, it's interesting. We, you know, when it comes to histamine intolerance, to be completely honest with you, part of this is your own personal experience. So if you were to consume almond butter or sunflower butter then and, and have these histamine intolerance symptoms, it, I wouldn't dismiss that, you know, and it, it doesn't mean that you're wrong or something like that. But what we have discovered is that for whatever reason, peanut butter and cashew butter, maybe it's the process in which they're made, they do seem to cause more symptoms for people that have histamine intolerance. And in creating this section in the, in the book, one of the things that I did is I actually had someone who she lives with histamine intolerance, so does her mom they have a genetic condition that predisposes them to histamine intolerance. And so she's figured out how to make all of these things work in her life. And I leaned on her personal expertise because there's no one who understands this more than this person who like not only her, but her mom are navigating this on a daily basis. And this is, this is the type of stuff that you discover is that again, like if the almond or sunflower butter triggers a histamine reaction, you should make note of that and you need to adapt for your personal self. But generally speaking, people that have histamine intolerance are going to be more capable of tolerating those two. Uh, here's an interesting question. So think about somebody whose stomach is always hurting. You think about maybe trying eating a bland diet and seeing if that works. Quinoa is a food I would assume would be part of a bland diet. But we have a question here from Banushka who writes, every time that I eat quinoa salad, my tummy hurts and I feel gassy and I feel like I need to go poop. She says uh, even when she does, she sees undigested quinoa in the poop, and that makes her not want to eat quinoa, but she struggles because she really loves that salad, Dr. B. So what could be going on here? Yeah, I, I love quinoa too, and so it's important for people to understand there are multiple different components or parts of our food that can potentially cause food intolerance symptoms. Food intolerance means that when you eat a food, it's causing unwanted symptoms afterwards usually digestive symptoms. So now quinoa technically is low FODMAP, but the issue, so meaning that people who are sensitive to FODMAPs, they generally will do better with quinoa, but it still is very high in fiber. And so as a result of that, some people are going to struggle with this. The approach that you take to this particular issue is to start low and go slow. The problem with quinoa is that when we consume it, it's generally as a very large part of a bigger bowl. Like this is a quinoa bowl. We're going to load up a big old bowl of quinoa and we got to, we got to back it up. Um, you know, you need to start off with what if it was like literally a tablespoon of quinoa and that's your serving for today. And then a couple days from now, about a tablespoon and a half. And we slowly ease into it. And by doing this, you are basically challenging your gut. It will rise to the challenge. It will grow stronger and it will become more capable incrementally at processing and digesting the quinoa until one day you discover like it's not, you're not measuring in tablespoons anymore. You're measuring in cups. How many cups are you putting into your bowl before you add whatever, like you're going to top it with chili or whatever it may be. That's the evolution of how we get our gut function back on track. 
Take a question from Jennifer, wondering about some beans. We haven't gotten to beans very much yet. She's wondering, why would black beans cause bloating when she eats them whole, but not so much if she blends them up or mashes them for a recipe? All right, so there's different ways that we can digest our food. Um, not so much with legumes. We don't typically ferment legumes, but... Um, you know, you could ferment food, and in many cases, by fermenting it, you are pre-digesting it. When it comes to legumes, there's ways that you can process your legumes to make it easier for you to consume them. One way is to soak them. When you soak legumes, it actually draws off a compound called raffinose. Although raffinose is not bad for us, it's actually quite good for our gut microbiome. But if you struggle with gas and bloating, it makes complete sense for you to do this. Soak your legumes, it draws off the raffinose, it enters into the water, you pour out that water, and when you pour out that water, you are pouring out the raffinose. Um, you can pressure cook your legumes. In the book, I actually describe exactly how to do that. That's one of the ways that we can actually make it more digestible That's how we do it. for our body. Um, but in this case, like blending it, you are disrupting the fiber. You are changing it. You are making it more easy to digest, breaking it up into smaller pieces. And this is the reason why a person, like, it's not just not just legumes. I mean, some people struggle when they're eating a kale salad. But then you throw some kale into a smoothie, they're perfectly fine. There are ways that we can pre-digest our food, including, you know, blending it, including uh, cooking it slowly, like, like in soups or stews or chilies, or by doing some of these techniques, like, for example, uh, soaking it, pressure cooking it, things like that. Let's talk about probiotics here. This is a good question from Pat. I'm going to go the fermentation route. Uh, Pat is wondering, what is the difference between the probiotics and fermented food and those that are found in supplements? Well, in some cases, they're not really that different, to be honest with you, in some cases. So, for example, uh, if you look at sauerkraut, I'm fascinated by sauerkraut. Because, <laughs> sauerkraut. Seriously, because I, I would have never, it's not just the fact that I'm Polish, there's more to it than just that. But it, 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 I would have never like really even thought anything of sauerkraut for the vast majority of my life. You know, to me, sauerkraut was the really nasty canned sake stuff that my mom put on a hot dog that I didn't like when I was a kid. And what I've discovered in recent years, though, is that sauerkraut is this vibrant electric food that tickles the tongue and it transforms and brings out flavors when it's surrounded by other stuff. And it's so good for us. And what's really cool about sauerkraut chop, the reason why I'm focusing on that with this question, is that if you take a cabbage, like when I make sauerkraut, I, I don't need a sauerkraut starter or special bacteria. I just go to the store and I buy cabbage. And I chop it up. And I put it into uh, a mason jar with some salt water brine. And then, like seven days later, it's starting to become sauerkraut, and it really becomes mature and, and optimal probably at two, three, four weeks. Um, so in there, you will find bacteria like Lactobacillus plantarum, very prominently featured. Well, Lactobacillus plantarum is actually a probiotic, and you could go to the store and you could buy a probiotic with Lactobacillus plantarum and pay for it. You could also make sauerkraut. Um, the difference between a probiotic capsule and the food is that the food is going to be a much more wide variety of different types of microbes represented in smaller proportions. Whereas the probiotic is typically going to be a far more limited number of microbes represented in very high proportions, very high counts. And so it's kind of like a very targeted boom. We're dropping all these specific, like, you know, one to five microbes. Boom, we're dropping these specific ones in there in a very high concentration with the hope that it helps you. Versus with the probiotic foods, the fermented foods, it's instead like, enjoy this food. It has fiber, it has polyphenols, and it has probiotics, all of which are good for your gut. All right, well, so now you're talking about fermenting cabbage. Naturally, then, my mind, you're a sauerkraut guy. I'm a kimchi guy. Love me some oh, kimchi. I love kimchi too. Uh, some kimchi recipes, uh, if you buy some in the, in the store especially, they'll come with sugar in it. And I'm wondering how that might affect the beneficial properties of the fermentation if there's sugar added to a food. 
Yeah, so, well, first of all, there's uh, recipes for both sauerkraut and kimchi and um, torshi, which is a cauliflower ferment and fermented salsa and sourdough bread. All of these things are in my new book. There's a chapter yeah. exclusively about <laughs> fermentation yeah, we're good, yeah. with the recipes that you need to do this. So, like, Chuck, you get to have your kimchi. You can make it. Yeah. <laughs> and I like kimchi, too. The, uh, the issue is that when we buy food that has been prepared by the food system, you have to understand their responsibility is to create products that motivate you to come back and buy them again. And they will manipulate that food in whatever way possible that gives me, them an advantage for that to actually take place and to happen. So, uh, so they'll add sugar to foods that don't actually need sugar because they're hoping that you eat it and you're like, oh, this tastes good. I'm going to come back and buy this kimchi product one more time. So, you know, on the flip side, what we need to uh, do is make it ourselves and then we don't have to worry about what the food system is doing to our food. Uh, you know, we, we, I've called you the Prince of Poop before, but I think I'm going to switch that over to the Pharaoh of Fermentation now. Uh, you are passionate about some fermented food, man, and I absolutely dig it. You know, when uh, when I was down there uh, helping build the studio not too terribly long ago, I remember seeing your jars of sauerkraut that you had fermenting, and I didn't get a chance to try any, but definitely next time I'm in, uh, in town, I definitely want the Dr. Will Bolsowitz sauerkraut extravaganza to happen. It needs to happen. Oh, definitely. And let me make a quick comment on, um, a, a quick comment on the salt content in fermented food. Yeah. So when we make these foods, typically salt is a required component in order to achieve optimal food safety. Um, if you eliminate the salt, then the ferments can kind of spin out of control and turn into something that you don't want it to be. So, you know, we, this is part of like doing things properly is to actually measure your salt content and make sure that it's there. People will often say, well, isn't salt like bad for us? Of course, in excess, in excess. But when you consume a healthful diet that includes a couple of bites of fermented foods, I can assure you that is not an excess of salt. <laughs> That's very different than the person who's eating chips all day long, right? So it's important to, I, I just think it's important to understand the nuance that the foods that we raise concerns about, part of the reason why we raise concerns about them is because people are wildly over consuming the salt. But when you consume a healthful diet, you are not radically over consuming salt and you should not be fearful of consuming a couple of bites of sauerkraut. You're not hurting yourself in doing this. And the research actually backs up that you are helping yourself. New research out of Stanford University in the last year that showed us that you can actually radically improve your gut health in just 10 weeks by adding some fermented food to your diet. There you go. So uh, you're, you're still a sauerkraut on top of the uh, avocado toast guy. You've done that one, right? You, you with enjoy the that one? Speaker. With the with balsamic, balsamic, balsamic vinegar. vinegar. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, let's see here. What is the difference between the fiber found in Metamucil and the fiber that comes naturally in food? Yeah, so Metamucil, the, the orange drink that my grandma used to stir so, so that she could have a bowel movement. It's so exciting, isn't it? Um, <laughs> this is, Chuck, this is, Metamucil is the reason why the other day I walked into a local bookstore here in Charleston and I said, hi, I'm Dr. Bolsowitz. I'm, I'm the author of Fiber Fueled. And the, the attendant, who was probably uh, 19 years old, she was a college student, she says to me, you're kidding, you're Dr. Bolsowitz. She's like, I thought you were 85 years old. <laughs> and I, you haven't read Fiber Fields, have you? You're just judging me based upon the word fiber, aren't you? <laughs> you're you're, you're the only person that would possibly write a book about, seriously, this did happen, I'm not kidding. You're, 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 you're basically saying that the only person that would possibly write a book about fiber is an 85-year-old. Uh, no, fiber is sexy. It's exciting. And the issue is it's way better than Metamucil. So there is a role for prebiotic fiber supplements. I'm not saying that they're not useful, but we want to get our fiber from our food. That's where we want it to come from. You don't want to start cranking up the Metamucil. You want to start cranking up the varieties of plants. And because every single plant has fiber, it's not, it's not hard to find fiber. Every single plant has fiber. When you quite simply consume a wider variety of plants, you're getting the fiber that your gut microbes need in order to thrive. Can Metamucil be added to that as a supplement? 
yes, that's the role of a supplement. You add it to an already healthful diet in order to take it to a slightly higher level. So I personally prefer other uh, prebiotic fiber supplements instead of Metamucil. I find Metamucil a little bit hard, uh, for people do. So, you know, for example, uh, um, acacia powder, partially hydrolyzed guar gum, meat dextrin, these are some of the options. But if you like your Metamucil, that's okay, no problem. Uh, you talk about gluten quite a bit in the Fiber Fueled cookbook as well, and Amber is wondering whether gluten kind of gets a bad rap when we think about our health. Well, I think that, so let me say this. First of all, I, I always have to say this because there's always someone who's going to say, yeah, but what about celiac disease? If you have celiac disease, you need to be gluten-free, period. End of story. Um, so, but let's move outside of celiac disease, and let's talk about gluten in wheat. I think this may shock some people, but wheat is not just gluten. There's other stuff in wheat. There's fiber, there's polyphenols, there are vitamins, there are minerals. There's actually a lot that's good for your gut microbiome. If you, if you look at like real studies where people are eating bread, it's high quality bread, they are enhancing the health within their gut microbiome. They're helping, for example, bifidobacteria, which are healthful microbes to actually grow and be more powerfully represented. So we, uh, is gluten criticized unnecessarily? I think what's happened is that there are people who have like lost the nuance of the conversation and they're just painting with broad strokes like, oh, gluten must be bad because here are some of the reasons why we think it's bad. Okay, there is nuance, there is a difference between the junk food in the center of your supermarket that is wheat and gluten containing and, for example, a high quality, organic, whole wheat sourdough bread. Don't tell me that that organic whole wheat sourdough bread is unhealthy. It is not. That is a, that is a healthful food and it does contain gluten and it also contains fiber and polyphenols and vitamins and minerals. So the point is this, quite simply, and I could dig into some of the studies, but I don't want to take 10 more minutes on it because it's, it's, it's a bit of a complex topic. And I do talk about it quite a bit in the book. But if you have celiac disease, you need to be gluten-free. If you don't have celiac disease, you should be including high quality sources of whole grains. And that may include wheat, high quality sources, not the junk food, right? If you choose to be gluten-free, it's okay. You can still be healthy. But you need to move into gluten-free whole grains. Sorghum, quinoa, teff, amaranth. These are a couple of examples. Interesting question. I wonder if gluten could play a role here. Uh, Monica is wondering if a person were to eat a pizza that is made using vegan cheese and they still feel sick after eating that, could it be the gluten perhaps in the crust that's at play here, or could it be any number of other things that are still the issue? So it could be the crust. That doesn't mean it's the gluten, which I know is a shocking idea for a lot of people. <laughs> like, no, seriously, because I think it's like automatically, like if it's a weak containing food, it's like we're triggered. It's gluten. It has to be gluten. The answer is no. First of all, the studies say that for people that have digestive symptoms, after consuming wheat containing foods, actually, it's not the gluten, but it could be the fruit cans. Fruit cans are the parts of wheat that actually 